episode one. Kind of weird to hear myself say that. Equally important to me is the mental and physical health of our members of the military and first responders. I believe that whenever you get to your transition point, you need to be the best you, both mentally and physically, to succeed at and enjoy your transition. That brings me to my first guest, Shiloh Katanese, or as she's more affectionately known in the social media world, Dr. Shiloh. She used to be a police officer, so she has a particular interest in the self-care and resiliency of long-term mental health fitness for our first responders. She and I have been friends for over 20 years. I was one of her first training officers when she started her law enforcement career. As a matter of fact, I did such a good job that after seven years in law enforcement, she chose to leave go and get her doctorate degree in forensic psychology, and then chose to spend a decade getting into the minds of criminals. But in 2017, she circled back around to law enforcement and was hired by a large law enforcement agency here in Southern California to be an in-house psychologist providing clinical therapy to their officers and those officers' families. If that wasn't enough... Shiloh, along with her friend and colleague, Dr. Scott, began hosting their own podcast, L.A. Not So Confidential, in 2017. Their podcast addresses all things true crime and forensic psychology. So, after listening to this podcast, go give theirs a listen. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Long story short, the trainee has now become the teacher. Shiloh's been a huge help to me in getting this podcast off the ground. So, of course, she was destined to be a guest on this podcast. Episode 1 with Shiloh Katanese. This is the Transition Drill Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Pantani, and I've been a police officer for 30 years. I'll be having interesting conversations with guests who are former first responders, military, or both, and who will explain their experiences with their transition. I cannot say this enough. Prepare today for your transition tomorrow. Regardless of the why, you're closing in on your retirement, you just want to do something different, or other circumstances have or are forcing your transition. I believe this podcast will be beneficial to you. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Let's get into this. This this was the kismet thing. Yes. It's going to happen. Totally. Totally. So, am I your first interview? You are my first. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm so excited for this for you and that you did so much work on the back end cuz like I said, do it all up front. But the cra- So first. the crazy thing to think about is it's now 20 years since you were a trainee with me, right? 2000 Oh my god. It next year will be 20, 20. years. Yeah. So we're at 19. Yeah. To think oh, 20 so years ago and that today we're both basically now doing podcasts. I, I'm going to say I'm doing a podcast because I'm... Oh, yes, we're, you are. You we're can recording say it. something. You can say it. We're not working in the same place. We're we are not. Both podcasters. It's very strange. And <laughs> I was thinking on the way over here, I'm like, I wonder if I do have like good stories from when you were my training officer. And I feel like... No. I don't like it it was, I don't know if it was timing because you were my fourth one before I was going back to my primary. So hopefully like, you know, things were just kind of smooth. Every other training officer I can think of like crazy moments, but I really couldn't think of anything super remarkable. (laughs) I remember one time it, cause we were working night shift and I think it was, um, like, dusk you know it it was beginning of our shift and you were like no one ever taught you how to put the overheads on and when you're doing a traffic stop and I was like no (laughs) you're like what the fuck have they been doing with you (laughs) it was just a minor detail it was a minor thing that was so weird that no one had ever you know there's just so much to do training is god so the the one thing the one called all and it's not a call it was a traffic stop that still sticks out sticks out in my mind the kid 
at about three o'clock in the morning. Okay. Going to get medication for his mom who was sick. Do you remember that one? I don't. So we stopped him. He, I want to say he might have been 14. Stop it. And How do I not remember this? mom was sick at home. She sent him to the store to get medication. Oh. And you were like, no, we're not towing his car. He's doing something good for his mom. And I was. You're like, but he's 14. <laughs> And I still remember that. But I remember oh my in gosh. my head going, she's got to make her own decision. Yeah. This is her decision to make. She's not going to tow the car. But I was like, he's 14 oh, years old. I know. But what's the, you know, I guess I was thinking down the road. Now mom's sick and she has a towed car and they didn't have Uber back then. It, <laughs> no. Um, in hindsight, huh. that, that, was, that was the right decision to make. Yeah. And, and more importantly... It was the right decision for you to make because the, ultimately that was my job is to get you to the point where you're making your own decisions. True, um, true. But I just, that was one of those ones that just, I remember sticks out in my mind. But I, I, again, like in reflection, I think that's the beauty of that phase with you is that I had been all through the basic stuff and it it's the most, FTOs are the most important jobs in policing. I'm... I, will, I say that all the time, but to have your trainee at that transition point going from, okay, all the learning that's going to soak in is done. Now you need to fly little one. Like <laughs> that's pretty important. TOs are very important. I also tell people though, the, the most training you get is that first time you're out in the car by yourself and oh it's, my it's, gosh. it's now all of a sudden everything best. is on you. Yeah. But because it's also the best. It, it is, but it's also from what I remember, kind of nerve wracking because you're sitting there going, oh, it's all on me now. Yeah. And there's no one to bounce it off of. Should, should I stop this car? Oh, wait, I can make the decision if I want to stop this car, you know? Oh, my um, God. Should I turn left to here and go up the street? I don't want to go left. I want to go, you know, so I it's. Do whatever I want. So it. 20 years ago, that's. 20. Madness. Well, 19. Almost, we're, almost. We're, we're not rounding up yet. Well, I think I went into the academy in 2002, so. Actually, might be at like eighteen years ish. That's a that's a human being. That's an adult. You're you're now an adult. <laughs> I've done my job. I've raised you. Yes, yes. So going to your podcast, though, one of the yeah. questions that I've because I listen to it quite frequently. What do you think the fascination is with crime and the I call it the drama behind crime? This is a very good question. I think. A lot of people are trying to answer right now because true crime in every media space is totally having its moment, right? Like it is everywhere. Uh, my podcast partner, Dr. Scott, and I, you know, have been approached to do some things in the television realm. And I could tell you, producers are being tasked with like, 50% of your time needs to be developing true crime content. So it's it's having a major moment. It's huge. The interesting thing is that 80% of true crime content consumers are women, which as a psychologist, I start to go, okay, what is that <laughs> about? Um, I just went to CrimeCon for the first time, which is a true crime convention. Never heard about it till I listened to your podcast. Yeah. So it was in Austin, Texas this year. It was downscaled a bit because of COVID. They didn't quite know, you know, if it was going to happen or not. They usually have like three to 4,000 people. And it had about 1,500 this year, attendees. And it's 80% women. It's very middle America traveling to come to these areas to hear Nancy Grace on stage talk. Um, you know, sort of these true crime celebrities. I'm doing hard air quotes there, um, as well as victims, victim families, and professionals in the field talking about what they do. And there's just all different outlets for it. So like coming back around, the fascination with it, I, the one sort of theory that I would say the strongest theory that's out there, especially for women, is that there's something innate inside of us that draws us to it because we are so often victims of violent crime. Um, and we walk around very fearful gotcha. a lot of the time. 
of being victimized. Um, and I hate that I can't remember who said it, but there's a quote where when a man and a woman are on a first date, the man is usually terrified that she's not going to like him or not going to find him funny. She's terrified that he's going to kill her. It's like we think about different things. Wow. Right? So the theory is that we kind of consume it and watch it to learn from it. Okay, how can I watch this episode of Snapped? Or, no, that's actually usually the woman killing her husband. (laughs) Uh, How can I watch this other episode of Forensic Files or whatever and learn from it how to keep myself safe? Right. So that is a leading theory. I think think it's a little simplistic, to be honest. Uh, I'm a science-based person or evidence-based person. The majority of violent crime is man against man. So... You know, men aren't really being drawn to true crime as much. But is that because, you know, it's part of their narrative to sort of be tougher and understand that violence kind of can come with it. Boys get, boys get into fights. Some right. men, you know, have some sort of uh, criminal element at some point maybe. Maybe, you know, um, anyway. I, I just think it, it's it's more par for the course for being a man to kind of understand that, yeah, this could happen. This could cross paths with me. Um, I, I think we're interested in human behavior. And it, that's what, you know, drew me to my career choices is being really interested in human behavior. And then criminal behavior fascinates us because it lets us look behind the curtain right. on something that a lot of us don't understand. Or we have a very limited understanding of what we're just seeing on the news. So these shows and these podcasts and these docu-series really take us really deep to try and understand what's going on because we go, oh my gosh, how I don't understand that at all. How could that person be so different from me to do these terrible things? I want to know everything. What I've found interesting, so we haven't even mentioned your podcast yet, LA Not So Confidential. Thank you. What... I find interesting about it is a lot of the cases that you're reviewing are not recent. A lot of them are going back 50, 60, 100 years. Yeah, yeah. And what I've found interesting is you're you're taking the limited of available information, but then where you and Dr. Scott make it interesting is you're examining the information from a psychologist perspective, sure. not the law enforcement perspective. And so some of the things that I've heard you guys pull out in just reviewing some of the information, and, and you, it, you hit on the point that these are just our opinions based right. on what we're reading. Right. But it's interesting to get a different perspective. One of the things that, and, and granted, I'm, I'm, I would say that I don't follow crime stories in depth, but for instance, when you talked about the Night Stalker case, yeah. and the one aspect that I had never heard of in anything was that he had an uncle or something that took him out peeping. Yeah. And so it's like, oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the, the one thing that really stood out from that that you guys hit on is most of his victims were elderly or had some sort of issue. Sure. Some type of handicap. I, I loosely call yeah. it a handicap. Yeah, yeah. They were more vulnerable. To think that these were not just random. He had to have targeted his victims somehow. Sure. And that ties back into he was probably out in these neighborhoods, bef- you know, peeping or whatever. Doing so it's his just, surveillance. Yeah. Just doing, but when you bring it out, it's like, oh, different aspect to think about. Yeah, it and the old, the really like 100-year-old cases, because we we did an entire series towards the beginning of the summer of like vintage LA noir cases. And we feel like that gives us more liberty to sort of make some more assessment and assumptions that aren't bordering on (laughs) violating our ethics because we're not assessing this person in front of us. It's so old. We can go from the records and everybody involved is dead. You know, it, it's a lot of fun to kind of look at it, not just from a psychological perspective, but like a, a a sociological perspective too. What was going on in Los Angeles in the 1920s and how were women being treated and thrown into mental institutions when they were just being difficult? Right. <laughs> and the the evolution of 
of psychology, but also our culture and society is really interesting to peel back. Very, very true. It, when you give anything uh, enough time behind it, yeah. you can look at it from a different set of eyes, and all of a sudden you start looking at it and going, that was a pretty horrible way to, to, to deal with things, deal with people, yeah. treat. I don't, you could almost make the argument of you just, con- the people who had the money just controlled things, sure. and they made people disappear. Yeah, the money and um, the power. And, and to, to sit there and think that you couldn't have that today, I don't know, but it seemed to be more prevalent yeah. back then. Yeah, and it, that was really our whole reason for starting the podcast was that in this space of true crime, we felt like there wasn't anyone currently working in the field looking at it through this forensic psychology lens, which he and I are both trained um, as forensic psychologists, that could give this insight. You know, a lot of it was a couple of friends sitting on a couch reading Wikipedia about like these gruesome murders and then just kind of um, talking about the salacious nature of it. But we knew there was a void there of just what is, what makes up these folks. And sometimes it takes a lot of empathy and understanding and we're kind of forcing our audience to think about some of these uncomfortable things like, would Richard Ramirez had grown up to be this if these things didn't come into place, if he didn't have head trauma, if he hadn't had exposure to you know, voyeurism um, or murder, or he witnessed a murder of a relative, you know, right in front of him. So I think we just want people to be critical thinkers, even with these monsters. Gotcha. So going back to how all of this starts, <laughs> yeah, we have a connection through law enforcement. Tell me how you came to law enforcement. Wow. So I feel like my journey is different because, so my, I grew up in a law enforcement family. My parents were both LA County deputies and it was, and I mean my mom, my dad and my stepdad. So throughout childhood, that was just what I knew. I was in sheriff stations, um, around it all the time and wasn't an interest of mine to become a local city, county law enforcement officer. Was your interest, though, to go towards law enforcement? Even as, uh, How young did you know that that's what you wanted not, to do? Not super young. I didn't think that. But once I got into college, I thought, okay, I this really interests me. Again, I think it was you know, human behavior and what makes people do this. So I decided to double major in psychology and criminal justice And still didn't, like, I didn't feel a perfect fit anywhere, but I knew I didn't want to be a cop. (laughs) Spoiler alert, that does happen. Um, So I remember being at Cal State Fullerton. I hate to break it to you, though. You Uh were a cop for a little while. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, I know. (laughs) So I was at Cal State Fullerton, and I was part of the Criminal Justice Student Association, and we would have guest speakers come in and tell us about their jobs out in the field. And this California Department of Justice special agent came in and I was like, that's it. All I need is my bachelor's degree. I don't have to work the streets and I can have the title special agent. (laughs) You know, it, it felt like a good fit. I felt like, okay, I, again, this was very naive, but I was like, I think investigations is where I want to be. You know, everyone wants to be a detective first, right? (laughs) So I totally fell victim to that mindset, <laughs> but I kind of felt, found a workaround. I was like, okay, I can go straight there. And by the time I graduated, they were on a hiring freeze, the state of California, like they often are right. because we don't budget our money very well in this of state. Course. Um, so I had already, I was working at a local police department as a cadet while I was in college just to get to know law enforcement from the inside. Um, I did a bunch of things, but I mainly ended up being the property and evidence cadet. So I was working back with the detectives, getting a lot of exposure to that. And I graduate and like six months goes by and I'm like, okay, here I am working as a cadet and at Starbucks. And then like a year is coming around. I'm like, all right, I'm a freaking college graduate. Like I need to figure this out. So 
California is still on this hiring freeze. And I go, all right, well, then I guess I'm going to go federal because I can't wait around for California to get its shit together. So can I cuss on this yes. show? Okay. <laughs> um, I will check the explicit okay. box. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I set my sights on the FBI, but I needed experience. I couldn't just do it with a degree. And our captain at the time, he was wonderful. He was very pro-female um, officers at the department. And I went to him and I said, I was very forthcoming and said, I want you to, to hire me as an officer, but I have to be honest and say I'm not planning on staying here forever. And But I, I would be super gracious for the, the experience and the training and he said, just give me four good years, and we'd love to have you. And I said, great, because four years is all I need <laughs> uh, to apply to the FBI. Um, so I went through the process and uh, went to the Sheriff's Academy. Just backing up briefly. Yeah. So yeah. we both have that same connection. We were both cadets at the same agency. Yep. Were you not working 40 hours a week as, as a, a cadet? cadet? No, it was part-time. See, the, when, when I was there... We worked part time, but we worked two twenty hour weeks. Oh my god! So that's how I forgot you were a cadet there. Yep. Um, so yeah, they only had you working twenty hours a week. Hence the reason you needed it. It was like yeah, I mean occasionally Starbucks. I would get more, but yeah, I was working at Starbucks, and then I ended up uh, quitting Starbucks to become a babysitter for one of our dispatchers. Okay. And because she was working night shift and she was newly divorced, and so um, I ended up doing that, but. Yeah, so I went to the academy and um, started as a cop, which I said I never <laughs> wanted to do. And uh, that's how you and I met, because you were my fourth training officer. And Well, obviously, I knew you before right. that, because <laughs> I had been working there. But um, so about a year in, I, no, two years, two years in, I said, you know what? I need to go back to school. I need to go back to graduate school. I'm going to get my doctorate because then the FBI can't turn me down. Well, you were telling me during training that yeah. your plan was to get your doctorate yeah. and that your long-term goal was the FBI. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that had been my trajectory for, I mean, a very, very long time. And I, uh, you know, onward about a decade. Was so did really you start your, time. your advanced degrees while you were still in, active in law enforcement? Yeah. Okay. So I, I started, I, I didn't do a master's program. I went straight into a doctorate program and I started that the same year that I got married. It was a couple years after, um, passing probation at the police department. And so I would, it was perfect. I would work weekend nights patrol and then I would do school during the week and it was all, it wasn't online. It was, you know, in-person classes and then it was a five-year program. The last two years, well, no, I'm sorry. The last three years were internship, but the two first years of that were part-time. So same thing. I would do internship during the week, work patrol during the weekends. Um, and then my final year, I didn't want to break it up. I just wanted to do my full-time internship and get it over with. So I took a leave of absence from the police department for a year to do my internship and at the end of my internship, I was processing with the FBI. They had given me a conditional job offer. And then my internship, which was working, it was in the community, working hand-in-hand -hand with parole and probation, but I was doing sex offender risk assessment and therapy treatment for uh, sex offenders coming back into the community out of prison. And they said, we want to hire you. So here I was like, had my blinders on, was on my path, and all of a sudden, you know, I'd never wanted to be a cop. I didn't want to be a psychologist. I was like, just get me the degree and give me the information. I want to go to the FBI. <laughs> right, right. And here I had these two, like, wonderful things, these choices in front of me, and I really loved what I was doing. And by that time, I was married, and the FBI could have sent me anywhere. And I was like, do I want to go to another academy? <laughs> I hate running. Um, what if I end up in like Detroit or something? I'll be divorced in a year. Like it was just all these other things. And that is one of the things that 
people will often ask me about, you know, who want to come into law enforcement. Yeah. And they'll say, what do you think about the FBI? Great. There's Im- immense opportunities, but you have to understand when it comes to your family, your potential of being relocated yes. is high. Very, very. Well, and they expect that you continuously promote. And that means changing assignments, changing locations. And I now, through what I do, work with a lot of FBI agents. And that's it. Like, they're either single and they're cool with moving around, which is what I thought for myself. Of course, I never was going to get married either. And then I met this amazing man So basically, Baker, every, everything you <laughs> say that you're, you don't want to do. I know. Exactly. Um, What's the next thing you don't want to do so I can put money on it? Right? Right? Um, I don't know. I have to think about that. But... Yeah, they, they move around. They're either single and move around or their entire family just is good with like uprooting and moving and they have amazing partners and kids that are good with that. I remember, so I, I spent a couple of years assigned to the FBI doing computer forensics. Oh, right, right. And I remember there was one agent that really wanted to get back to Houston, I believe. Okay. The Texas area. Yeah. But it, it's a it's a high priority office it, the, everybody in their grandmother wants to get to that office yeah. and her way of moving up that list quicker was to take a posting in puerto rico oh interesting you know but she was single so she could yeah. do that yeah but to think that oh if i go to puerto rico for two or three years that doesn't guarantee me it just moves me up a uh, higher on the list exactly it makes me jump over people who are waiting and so it if you Think about that from a family perspective. Right. There's a lot of families that won't do that. Exactly. And even I, my mentor, law enforcement mentor, was the assistant special agent in charge at Los Angeles. And even he was like, I cannot guarantee you come back here. And that's all, that was all I needed for my decision. And I decided to pursue psychology. I'm like, all right, I guess we're taking this train instead. And it was the best thing, best decision ever. So side note, what is the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist? A psychiatrist goes to medical school and they specialize in psychiatric disorders and they, because they're medical doctors, they can prescribe medication. Gotcha. Psychologists can't in gotcha. the state of California. Okay. So psychiatrists actually have to go to medical school. Yes, they are, they are MDs, right? Gotcha. So they're, they're more on, you know, the biological... Uh, makeup of what's going on with a lot of mental health disorders and we're trained in the modalities of how to tr- how to treat that with therapy instead of medication or in conjunction. But you knew all along that your goal, not necessarily to be a psychologist, but was to work with the criminal aspect yeah. from the psychological perspective. Right. right. Yeah. It, I, the thought of working with like I mean, I could be really rich right now if I wanted to work with depressed housewives in Beverly Hills. You know, if, if I wanted to set up a private practice and hustle and do that, you can make a killing as a psychologist in Los Angeles. Um, I would be bored to death. Gotcha. So, yes, I, I still was like, okay, for me, the perfect trifecta was human behavior, criminal behavior, and then sexual deviancy. And that was... My my wheelhouse, that's what really was like, this is the most fascinating thing. I need to know everything about it. So then taking this in a different pers- or different avenue, Mind Hunter, is uh-huh. it a good show? Great show. Okay, because I was show. sad to see it in. <laughs> Me too. But if I'm understanding it correctly, then you were more interested in not necessarily fixing the problem, but in the sense of studying the people who do what they do, and then interpret that behavior going forward? Initially, yes, because, you know, mind you, the time that I entered into my doctorate program, I was thinking, like, FBI, right? And, of course, behavioral analysis unit, like, that would be the end goal. But I remember my very first internship was with Department of Corrections at a parole office, Orange County, and sitting in on my first sex offender group, And I was like, I just want to hear what they have to say. You know, just sit me in this group and let me hear what they have to say. And then they were like, okay, no, you're going to start individual therapy with this group member. And I was like, oh, God, what do we do? (laughs) You know, Um, okay. And I was like, I don't like that. Like, I want to soak it all in and hear it. And 
you get your experience where you can't, you got to do what you got to do, right. you know, in your internships and what they ask you to do. So yes, it very much my, from the outset, it was like, I just want to learn what they have to say of why they're doing it with that sort of research mindset. But then, you know, you get pushed into doing some things that you're not terribly comfortable with because you're a student and you're learning. And I really loved assessment where I could sit down with them for two hours, learn everything about them, apply these risk assessment tools to you're basically giving a score and data in a report saying how likely this person is to reoffend in the future and what will help them lessen that risk. And that to me, I was like, I love this because it's not therapy. I'm not sitting with them, you know, forever right. long term. I get to learn everything about them, assess them, and then I'm good. And I got really good at that. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to be like an assess assessment psychologist. But then <laughs> I got really good at group therapy. Uh, individual now love it. You know, it's a majority of what I do. But for the majority of the last decade, when I was working with sex offenders, group therapy was my jam. Like I just, I don't know. It. Some people can do it. Some people can't. I remember coming back to. I almost said our agency name. Ah, I remember coming back to the department <laughs> and when I was doing my internship and telling someone, you know, what I was doing at internship and they're like, so it's just you sitting in a room with nine parolees and it like blew their mind because we wouldn't even pat down a parolee by yourself, right? But it was so weird to explain the difference of, well, I'm not a cop in that room with them and yeah, there's a dynamic you learn as a facilitator and they have some respect for you. And, you know, there's... Were you working in a custody setting? Yeah, this was all in a parole office. So, I mean, there's parole agents everywhere, you know. It's it's but, not as if I'm by myself. But, but no. the group were not, quote unquote, in custody. They, they no, came in for their parole. session. Correct, correct. So, there, it's just a totally different dynamic. And it was, it, it was the best part of that job was figuring out how can I feel like I'm making a difference so another victim isn't created? Because that's the question I got all the time. How can you do that work? And I, my answer is I don't know how I can do it, but I can. And I, I feel like there's someone for every job out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could not be the psychologist that works with victims. It would tear me apart. I would take that home with me too much. And, you know, there's stuff that has affected me and I've taken home. But day in and day out, I don't know. I can do it. I can see these people as humans enough to be able to assess what do I need to do to work with them to mitigate the fact, you know, kind of reduce recidivism as much as possible. At the end of the day, it's all free will. They can do what they want. And I've had high-risk offenders that never go on to reoffend. I've had low-risk offenders that do horrific things. It's not a perfect science by any means. Um, but to feel like... I'm getting enough feedback from them that I know their thinking patterns are starting to change was really rewarding. So even though I, I started out really loving assessment the most, therapy became and treatment became super rewarding, especially working with the parole agents and being this team, we call it a containment team, to really make sure these guys are doing what they're supposed to do while they're on parole, but also when they get off parole that they're going to have the skills to be able to deal with the issues that led them to offend in the first place Right. to hopefully not do that again. Well, I remember, so for me, my detective experience is all property crimes. Yeah. And never really wanted to, to work the person's crimes. And it was driven home the one time I was asked, Arquette interview. Hey, uh -huh. I need you to go just sit in on this. Yeah. You're not going to do anything. You're just going to monitor the psychologist, interview the victim. Unless something comes out of complete left field that's completely opposite of what we already have in the report, Right. let me know. Yeah. And so I said, not a problem. I went and sat and listened to that interview, and it was a, a young female, and it was a family member. And I remember coming back to the station, and I said, I will do anything you ever ask me again except that. You need me to write 20 reports for you? Fine. Yeah. Don't ever ask me to go sit and listen to that. Well, fast forward to today, 
I oversee our child exploitation team. Oh, boy. And yeah. they're out tracking down, you know, the travelers and everything else. And granted, I don't have a direct hand in it because right. they're run, the teams are running their investigations. But I, I have truly come to believe that, granted, all crime is important. But the people helping the children, that's, that's, in my opinion, where law enforcement really comes to play. It is, and it's it's a double-edged sword because of the vicarious trauma um, that everyone in the criminal justice system who has to deal with sexual offenses is impacted by. And it's... Agreed. The ripple effect is... It's almost infinite. For one case, if you think about everybody that is impacted by that case from the patrol... If we're just... We're not even talking about the family, right? The patrol mm-hmm. officer, the detective the um, computer forensics person, the uh, the SART nurses, the lawyers, the judges, the jury that has to sit and listen to this, the parole agent, then they go to prison, and then afterwards, the psychologist that's working with them. It's just, it's like never ending, and that's one crime. And going back to FBI, with, with our team being affiliated as uh, FBI task force members, mm-hmm. one of the good things is the FBI does the mandatory right. counseling, right? which in my opinion, if you're dealing with these types of crimes and these types of people, that vicarious trauma yeah. is, I, I really honestly think that even as it's changing today, when I, when we talk about, because there's always been the long-term stigma of going to talk to a psychologist when you're a police officer. Of course. That is changing. Yep. I do believe it's getting better. It's not where it needs to be, but it's getting better. But to to have these people, you know, for me, I, I did computer forensics for several years. The majority of the cases involve, you know, images that the average person probably never wants to see. Right. And you you falsely kind of tell yourself, oh, I'm just, you know, you, you, you say, I job. see it, but I'm moving on. Right. But you're exposed to it yep. and it, it has its impacts. It does. And, you, and then, like you said, do you take it home and then do you explain that to your family or do you bottle it up and go, no, it was just a normal day? See, neither of those are good choices. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very tricky. Um, with those types of jobs where there's the high risk of vicarious trauma, they're also the jobs that you need somebody with good experience doing. So again, another double-edged sword, right? Do we rotate people out of that to try to mitigate the vicarious trauma? But then, you know, three years in, you just know what you're doing. Right. <laughs> and you're good at your job. So what is the right answer? And I think something along the lines of having mandatory debriefings, making sure that people have access to services, that again, it's usually on them, to access, but if you do sort of these mandatory check-ins slash debriefings, whatever you want to call them, um, that's probably the best happy medium unless a department just has a policy of we're going to rotate people out to limit their exposure. I don't know what the right answer to that is. I I lean more towards, like you talked about though, it, it comes back back to what's the learning curve to bring the new person up to that same standard of being able to investigate these cases properly. Right. Um, But we do, we got, we have to take care of our people better. Yeah, absolutely. And, And I know that from, from one of the things that I want to bring as part of this podcast, and one of the reasons why I was excited to have you as a guest is I where I've said that we are getting better when I say the law enforcement, the stigma is slowly going away of, hey, we need to, we need to have these people talk about, and not just the, the detectives that are handling the, the horrific child crimes. It's, it's all traumatic yeah, incidents. Right. And I, I've heard the, there's a lot of media attention behind PTSD related to the military, granted. They, they see some horrendous stuff. There doesn't seem to be as much behind law enforcement. And the, the two things that are bothering me, one is the increased number of suicides in law enforcement today. Two, the one, and I heard it explained very well, and I, I like this explanation, is 
military experiences stuff, but they they tend to be overseas. When they come back home, there's not the daily reminders. Right. You and I, as a police officer, we go to, even if it's a, a horrendous traffic accident where somebody's died and been decapitated or whatever, at the intersection of walk and don't walk, we go through that intersection for the rest of our career. Yep. yep. Worse, we go through that intersection with our family. Yep. You know, um, and if you don't deal with that, it has that ripple effect that you talk about. Sure. And so that's where we need to get better in really kind of addressing the mental aspect right. of police officers. I'm curious, when you say that you see that the, the stigma is getting less and less, how are you seeing that? Like what, what sort of markers are there that you're actually being able to acknowledge that? What I would say that I'm seeing is... If anything, at minimum, there's at least more talk. Yep. That's hey, important. It's okay to go do this. Okay. Um, maybe I am in a unique situation because of the direct affiliation with the uh, FBI task force mm-hmm. model mm-hmm. and going to mm-hmm. regular counseling to where it becomes less of a, oh, man, I got to go talk to the psychologist. Right. Um. I think also, too, in general, we as a society of law enforcement are changing. I know that millennials get bemoaned a lot, but at the same token, I think the younger generation coming into law enforcement is more open to expressing their feelings. They certainly are. And so when you and I started, or when 20 plus years ago, it was, hey, suck it up, buttercup. Right. Deal with this and go to the next one. And I think it's slowly changing to where if something really bothers you, it's okay to say, man, that really bothered me. With that, though, I think a a strong caveat is we have to do, and and when I say we individually, we've got to be better to our partners and go, you really don't look like you're doing well. Right. You know, and, and have that difficult conversation. Absolutely. Without being offensive. Absolutely. It needs to be peer-to-peer level, not being afraid to shoulder tap your buddy and saying like, hey, things are off. Like, what's going on? I'm here. But also from the top down, having the buy-in of support. Yes. Because I can tell you that in my own experience, as well as what I see now, so now I'm full-time employed as a law enforcement psychologist, and I've been doing that about four years now, but... I remember that the aftermath of my, eh, not so much one OIS, but the second OIS of just the hoops that I was put through and the scrutiny and the what the hell is going on, no one's telling me anything, was worse than the actual traumatic event. And I hear that day in and day out. Now, when I do officer debriefings, and talking, I, I work with a, a cadre of peer support members that have all been in OISs and they're there to help other people. Same thing. You know, it's it's the, the way that they're treated by the agency that is a longer duration. You have your shooting, you have your traumatic incident. It sucks and it's terrifying and it changes you. But when it's over, it's over. But this other thing ends up getting drawn out with people not giving a shit. Right. And, or at least... They might, but they're not letting that be known to the person who's impacted. And so that that feeling of isolation, plus you can't, you know, you just are forbidden from talking about it because there's an investigation going on. And I remember I was able to call one person. I don't think I reached out to many because I didn't want to put anybody in a weird spot. And I was like, would you feel weird to like just go to lunch with me because I just have to talk to somebody? And this person met me off duty and I probably said more than I should have, but I knew it was a safe space to be able to say, and it like meant the world. Um, And, and social support needs to be not just your friends or family, but the people you're working with too, because you eventually have to go back to that. So it, it, it does have to be peer to peer. We have to watch out for each other and not be afraid to say things, but having, you know, really support from 
the top down and down up. And I think that's another thing that's changed over my tenure in law enforcement is the whole peer support groups. Mm -hmm. Those weren't around when I first started. They're very much commonplace in most agencies today. So again, those are the little things that I do see changing. But going back to whenever you, you know, an officer gets involved in an incident, whatever it is, as soon as it transitions into an investigation, your, your agency is reviewing your actions. There's no way that, what do you want to call it? Um, Self-preservation doesn't kick in because already it's going to have an environment of adversarial totally. nature. Totally. No matter how much they try to say, hey, we're just trying to. And no, no matter how you're clean looking the shooting at me, was. Right. You know, <laughs> right. I need to now protect myself. Totally. Totally. And, and, and there are things in place that make you feel a bit better. You know, you have a union or a league and attorneys that roll out and, um, but then they're going to be like, we got you. You're good. Don't worry. But there's <laughs> but a lot to worry about. Until you want to trust them. Yeah. Until we determine, oh, wait a minute. You violated this policy yeah. here. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, exactly. It, and then, you know, the most frustrating thing was when I, I went back, when the FBI was about to do, start my background investigation, uh, I went back to our agency and I asked the chief at the time, I said, hey, can I just look at my overall packet? Like, I just want to know what's going to be in there <laughs> so I can give them a heads up. And he was like, yeah, of course. And I remember sort of being shocked that there was zero, uh, like shocked and very su- pleasantly surprised that there was nothing about my one very difficult OIS in there. And I was like, so there's nothing like, is there a secret file somewhere? Like what's going on? And he's like, I don't want the redacted file. Yeah. He's like, well, it came out clean and there was no IA. So why should it be in there? And then I was so pissed. Cause I'm like, then what the fuck did I go through? <laughs> like, it was, a, it was good. And then also still like, Oh, okay. I'll let it go. Shiloh. It's, it's all over. Yeah. But it, and it's hard to understand that if you haven't been through it mm-hmm. and I think that's the importance of peer support and trying to get as many people with different life experience and on the job experience to be peer support members. So people that are there can rely on someone with some sense of, you know, protection and confidentiality that um, they can just kind of walk through it with them because that's all we really need sometimes, (laughs) you know, not necessarily the advice or not necessarily like you should do this. Um, and our family members certainly don't know how to react to that stuff if they're not exposed to it. So, and, the, and no matter how many times you go through it, it's always the fear of the unknown. It's always 100%. the fear of what's going to come out after the review of this incident. Yes. And so even if you've, I mean, not that I want officers to be in multiple incidents, but right. even if you've been through it before, everyone is completely different. Oh, totally. Mine are like night and day. Um, yeah, it, it, it's going to be different because of having previous ones. You yes. know, we talk about cumulative trauma, um, or just the experience you're bringing to the table is going to shape how the individual reacts to a traumatic incident. Just everything that has come before, whether you're going to have good coping, whether you're going to have a little bit more baggage to deal with, or, you know, you knew that things were good the last time. So maybe you're falsely a little bit more relaxed for this one. And then things go to shit. It's 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 really really hard to navigate. So what what factored or facilitated your pivot off of working with criminals and going to just full time? It sounds like full time yeah. law enforcement working with law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I had been working with the criminal population a little over a decade, kind of looking for a change. I mean, I. I Love it. I actually still do a little bit of it in a private practice just to keep my expertise up in that area. And, but it it was time, you know, I, by then I had had my daughter and I'm like, I don't really need to be reading these reports every day, (laughs) day in and day out. Something does change when you have kids, when you're doing that work. And I was just looking for something new. And a friend of mine who had been a law enforcement psychologist for a separate agency heard that this position came up and, well, it was Dr. Scott, my podcast partner. So he, 
the agency that was hiring law enforcement psychologists, he was working with them, but in like a co-responder mental evaluation unit capacity. And he said, hey, they're hiring police psychologists. You should look into it. And it's funny because when I was going through grad school, because I was a cop, all my cohort, my fellow students were like, oh, are you going to be a police psychologist? And I was like, hell no. <laughs> I work with those fools every day. I don't, no, thank you. this to the list. <laughs> right, right, right. I'll I never know. be a police psychologist. Oh, God, no. Um, but then when he, he told me they were hiring, I was like, maybe it's time. Like, maybe I've been away from the job long enough that it can kind of come full circle. And I think... I kind of said like, okay, it's time to work with the good guys now (laughs) and offer them my support and and however I can help. So I looked into what they did and this agency really had, they'd been around the longest. They were the first agency in the country to have a police psychologist and an entire unit and they are the biggest in the country. Psychologists for the benefit of their officers. Yes, yes. So... And this unit didn't do any pre-employment testing or fitness for duty. And I said, great, because I don't want to be the person that (laughs) someone's career is hanging on. They were just there to support the employees of the department. And so I I thought, yeah, I I, I think this is something I'd like to do. And it was the best decision ever. The, The job is has so much variety to it. I get to do clinical work. So we take self-referred clients that want to come in. Any employee on the department, sworn or civilian, has basically unlimited free access to a psychologist. We also do couples therapy, and then we'll see their significant others can do individual therapy. And then, of course, we do all the mandated stuff. So like OIS debriefings, big debriefings for big other sorts of incidents, uh, case by case. (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. Take a sip here. And then it's kind of awesome because we get to do this organizational operational consultation too. So each psychologist is assigned a handful of divisions that they sort of go out to and they're that division's psychologist. So I'll collaborate with the commanding officers about whatever they need, training, uh, is morale low? Do you want me to start addressing some things in like roll calls? So I try to have the divisions have as much exposure to me as possible to help against the stigma. It's like every day I walk into the station, I know I'm like chipping away at it a little bit. And I've I'll, heard that analogy though. I've heard that yeah. if if you are around them enough to where you devaluing you but (laughs) those people (laughs) yeah if you're around them enough to where they start looking at you the same way they look at a lamp it becomes easier for them to then be open to you right and and I've seen it I mean in in four years of being there I do try to be there as much as possible I'll go on ride-alongs I just actually went on a ride-along yesterday day before yesterday um I go to roll call you know they'll usually give me 10 minutes or so and I'll give them their little wellness tip of the day or whatever we'll, Whatever they want to talk about. We'll kind of go from there. Um, and then I just kind of make my rounds. You know, patrol does their thing, but then there's a ton of other people on the station. Get to know them. Uh, officers that work foot beats in really, like, terrible, gross, disgusting areas. I'm like, hey, let me go with you so I know what you're saying on a day-to-day basis. They're like, are you sure, Doc? Like, you're going to have to burn your shoes after you leave. <laughs> like, no, no, no. I, I need to I need to be there. Um, and this week was great. It, it was actually, you know, curse of the ride-along. There was nothing going on. But the whole shift got together, and we went to go have coffee. And it was nice to just have them talk about the things that were really stressing them out right now. And it was, you know, it ran the gamut. But then I also had a brand new officer on training sitting there and he's like, well, ma'am, how do you know when you need to go to therapy? And I was like, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Thank you for not being scared to even speak, you know, right now. But it was just, that was the most fruitful part of the day was letting them get to sort of offload some of the stuff that's been going on just in like a casual round table sort of way over a cup of coffee of all the things that I wanted to talk to you about today that is the best segue because 
I really wanted you from the psychologist standpoint, those, the top five or the top 10 things, like what can you be seeing in yourself Mm -hmm. that like, hey, maybe I should go talk to somebody, you know, and and it doesn't have to be 10. I'm just saying, what would you, advice would you give to, because I've, and I'm deviating a little bit here. I've heard this lately of, you should just be going to talk to a psychologist just to go if you're involved in law enforcement because you see so much stuff that you're not even thinking is registering as traumatic. But for those who are kind of, maybe I don't need to, or maybe I do, what, what would you say would be something that they'd be seeing in themselves that should be triggers? This is the same answer I gave to that new guy yesterday. I said, you know, you are the expert on you. You know how you react to things. You know how you cope with things. Now you're experiencing something all new now, but you have a baseline of when you have stressors or obstacles about how long that takes you to get through those and, you know, whether there's a a reasonable amount of time to sort of bounce back from them because we're human, we're going to have our ups and downs, right? I said, but when you feel like the things you normally do to cope aren't doing it anymore, that's when you need to come in and you need to come in when the problem is this big, not 30 years (laughs) big, And I have too much of that. And usually it's because they got in trouble for something. You know, they did end up, they got a DUI or their wife is like, you need to go because otherwise I'm gone. (laughs) And I have a lot of that. But that's what I love about the millennials is they do come in when their problem's this big, which is so refreshing. And the stigma isn't there. It's like, hey, I live in a metropolitan city where all my friends go to therapy. Not a big deal. I want to be part of the in crowd. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Why do I not have my own therapist? And I'm not talking like, you know, the female records clerk that, you know, is like struggling with depression. I mean, like the toughest guy working the most elite unit who's 32 years old and like, hey, I have this thing going on, doc. Like, and I'm like, thank you. <laughs> but from the opposite side of it, if you are that big, tough, you know, whatever that stereotypical image is, mm-hmm. and you go to that call, whether it be a child, whether it be an adult of somebody who's been victimized, and it doesn't have an impact on you, wouldn't that be a trigger? <laughs> that would be a red flag. <laughs> Your brain is broken. <laughs> no, <laughs> no it, it, I, this is interesting because I just, I just got assigned to a division that includes our SWAT team. And I was sitting down with one of the commanding officers and we were talking about just sort of my expect their expectations of me and how I can help out. And we were kind of talking about that because I said, you know, I don't want us to let you all slip through the cracks because we think you're the best of the best. You got this. Like they're not infected by any of this. And he said, well, I feel like some guys really aren't affected by it. And I said, you know what? There is a small percentage of those folks that, they probably aren't. And that's probably why they're drawn to this. Like they can just go home, sleep like a baby (laughs) after, you know, the craziest thing. Biologically, something's probably broken in their brain. It's, it's like, um, did you see the documentary free solo? So the guy that climbs, I think I cut off, cut off his arm. No, but it's the other climber that doesn't use anything. And he climbed, um, the one in Yosemite dome. Yeah. Just free. So basically a person who's probably, in my mind, crazier than crazy. So Right. So uh, I was watching this documentary with my husband, and I'm like, that guy's brain is broken. (laughs) (laughs) And then the documentary goes on a little bit more, and he actually does go to a neurologist. They do brain scans, and there's a portion of his amygdala, which is responsible for the fear response, that does not light up when it's supposed to light up. So he looks down, and And he doesn't feel anything. So he's just Spider-Man. So I think there are some people like that. For a rock climber, though, that's probably a good... F- <laughs> exactly, right? So so I think it works in the same way in law enforcement that there probably are those folks. I think they're few and far between. Majority of them have a fully functioning brain where they just need to not stuff it down. But we don't do brain scans, but we do other testing when we hire law enforcement that you do want a little bit of a risk taker. 
You Did you have a hand in developing the MMPI? Oh, God, no. That was way before I was born. <laughs> Wait a minute. Thanks, Paul. You just asked me <laughs> the same question, reworded a different way for the 40th time. I know. It, it, it's actually not the greatest um, tool. They, they really need to revamp pre-employment testing for law enforcement. But there's a scale on the MMPI <laughs> for psychopathy. And you actually want that to be a little bit elevated with your law enforcement folks because you want them to have enough bravery to be able to run into situations Makes and sense. be a little risk taking. Now, sometimes <laughs> that works against because cops have this risk taking nature and that comes out in other parts of their lives or even on the job. I mean, there's plenty of um, room for it to come out on the job, but then you know, whatever the top 10 things are that cops get in trouble for, that happens a lot because the personality type that wants to do this job in the first place. Well, I would all almost imagine that if you have a little bit of it coming in, over time, that little bit is just going to be reinforced when you have the, you know, almost to the to no other term, when you're praised for kind of, mm-hmm. hey, man, that guy, he can go do this, and then, or she, and, and they're right oh, yeah. back at it the next day. That's, that's not great. No, it's not. It's, and especially when you're feeding into that, and you're sort of living in the red all the time, and if you're just hard charging all the time, you're getting the good feedback and accolades for it, so you just want to do it more, because that's now what's fueling your confidence and your ego, you can only do that so long. Right. And, you know, it, it's very, depending on what the assignment is, but it's very comparable to being in a hypervigilant state all the time, mm-hmm. which is not good. You know, if those chemicals are flowing too much, you're going to have a bunch of underlying stuff you need to deal with. And the majority of the time, it's through alcohol. Um, but, or it turns into depression that goes untreated. And definitely when we talk about the suicide rate of law enforcement officers, if you really break down the numbers, if you're a total stats nerd, it's not much different than the general population, but it's different than it should be because we're screening out. We're doing a psych exam on the front end, right? So we're hiring the most healthy, mentally well people. So what's happening? Something's happening after they get on the job. And that's what's leading to it. And with with law enforcement suicides, when we sort of do these psychological autopsies, the what we call the deadly triad is what we see. We see the same three things. There's underlying untreated depression, there's usually alcohol abuse, and a recent loss of a relationship is kind of the last thing that um, tips this over into that way that looking like it's a way out for the person. Gotcha. So I think it's really interesting to to look at those three things, and we can probably all think of people that fit that or have fit that at some point that we've crossed in our careers. Um, And it's devastating because there's there's answers to all those things. So then if the numbers mirror society Mm -hmm. have the number of suicides just in the general population also increased over yes. the years? Oh okay. my gosh, yes. So yeah. we, we are staying for s- some degree in proportion with yes. society. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we have. I think last year was the only year that something else was killing officers um, at a higher rate than suicide, and it was COVID. But um, that's that's been like the only anomaly year. Okay. So with the, the, when I came across this idea for this podcast of getting to your transition point, one of the things that, that came or was important for me was when you get to that transition point, be that best you you can be. Mm-hmm. Um, we all have experienced those partners that we've worked with who have retired and it's like they fall off the face of the earth, no pun intended, yeah. after retirement. Right. And and so with that, I guess going back to what you were saying is not everybody needs to necessarily immediately run out and start going to counseling or, or, or seeing a psychologist, but we need to be better about 
looking in the mirror yeah. and saying, do I need some help? Right. What's my family life like? What are my relationships with my friends like? Because if you get to your transition point, but you're not happy or you're not coping well with life, what have you accomplished? Right. And what are you going to default to? What are you going to do? You know, you're either going to just isolate your, if you already drink or have a, an issue with alcohol abuse, you're just going to keep doing that. It, what kind of life is that? You know, I, it's so, isn't it weird? Like how when people get on the job in law enforcement, like they can't wait to retire. Like That's all they talk about. Constantly counting down. But they never talk about what they're going to do afterwards. Right. The only thing is, I got to get to retirement. Yep. I got to get to retirement. I got 22 months left or whatever. They have the little countdown on their phone now with apps. And it, it is... I think there's a couple things going on. Yet yeah, what you said, you need you need you need to evaluate, look in the mirror, and maybe you can fix some of those things yourself. I'm not saying you need to go to counseling, but start building your social support system. Start building the things you want to do, your hobbies, your interests, how you take care of yourself. If you're not already doing that, I mean, you should be doing that in the moment anyway, but you know, you can do a lot of the work so that you are good afterwards. But if you do need to see someone and say, like, I I offer this all the time, like, hey, okay, you're 23 months out. You know, a year from now, why don't you come in? We do sort of this, like, we call it retirement counseling. But really, it's like, come in and let's talk about what you're fearful about, what you start to stress about, what's your plan. Uh, We can help in sort of, like, decision-making skills. Um, Unfortunately, I think a lot of people get to retirement, and it's not the way they had pictured it for the last, you know, 25, 30 years, either the relationship status is different. Um, they want to move out of California because of, you know, they don't want their pension taxed as much and it's super expensive. And it's like, well, but where am I going to go? Who am I going to be around? Uh, who are my friends? How do I make new friends after the age of 40? I have this conversation with people all the time. (laughs) Uh, and all of a sudden it's like, boom, it's here. Um, But with that comes the fact that they have only identified with that one role for so long. And that's like the kiss of death. You have to be more than just a law enforcement officer. Correct. Well, And early on. Yes. And I think the other aspect of it is, is that they get so focused on getting to retirement and their life in general is at 100 miles an hour because they're- They're more off, more than likely raising kids, getting their kids to college, yep. doing all the stuff, you know, getting their house just perfect yep. or, or whatever they're doing. Everything's at 100 miles an hour and then they retire and it goes to 20 miles an hour. Uh-huh. Their kids are out of the house. Uh-huh. They don't have the external hobbies because they haven't developed that or, or, or fostered that, you know. And so, and then like you said, then you add to that and if you leave what little bit of a social circle you have and go and find yourself now, how do I make new friends? What do I do? What do I go do? Right. And, and so it's, it's all about taking care of yourself. And the other aspect in, in developing this podcast is it had its infancy in life after law enforcement yeah. in the sense of retirement. But what I've found in talking to people in, in developing this is that many of them don't make it to quote unquote retirement. They make it to whenever it's, if you've seen that meme is today, some kids are going to go outside and play for the last time and they don't realize it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There are law enforcement officers. There's military members. Today will be the last day of their career, but they don't realize it. Yes. And unfortunately today may not be what they were planning for. Exactly. And so You need to be thinking today for tomorrow, even if tomorrow isn't for another 10 years. Right, right. Yeah, having having that overlap sort of with, okay, here's my law enforcement career, but who who else am I? (laughs) What are my other roles? What are my other things that I do? Have those happening simultaneously at some point so there can be a smooth transition. But what you're talking about, I have seen unfortunately, so much in the last year. I I mean, this is just sort of anecdotal of who has ended up on my caseload. But like, 
young guys with young families who have been injured, like freak things happening, you know, some stuff out of the protests from last summer, some stuff from just like doing their job and like horrifically, they will never be a cop again. And they're still able to see me because, you know, they're going through that year of the aftermath and they're still kind of on the books with the department, but they're really having to wrap their heads around not just not being a cop, but some of them like so disabled that I don't know what they're going to really do. And it is not what they pictured. It really isn't. Or, you know, there's the other things like you can get in trouble for things or, you know, you sort of get, um, asked to leave in certain (laughs) ways, you know, there's all sorts, I think whenever we don't leave on our own account, it's really hard. Even my mom, when she finally left law enforcement, it was more under medical, you know, reasons. And like, that's not what she had pictured. She wanted to keep working, but really couldn't. And so that's really hard to just have some resolve about. But one of the other things that they need to think about is you can get that injury that whether it be law enforcement or the military, that they say you can't do this job anymore, but you're still able to function. It's not, yeah, it's not an injury that's so horrific, like yeah. y- you, you're decapitated or lose an arm or something right. like that. Decapitated, you know. You know <laughs> well, that would be Not much you're going to be finite. doing after that. <laughs> um, just walking around holding it in your hand. <laughs> Maimed. But that's the extreme. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the minor is shoulder, back, knee, whatever, totally. to where your agency goes... Yeah, you know what? Sorry, it's you, you it, don't meet the job criteria here. You're you're now a liability for us because yep. if we put you back out on the street and you jack your back or your knee up again, now we're going to be paying out a lot more money. So yep. we're just going to ask you to right take your medical and and go somewhere else. And medical isn't a, a medical retirement is isn't as great as like we all thought it no, was no I remember we had a neighbor who was like our age and we're like oh he medically retired from this agency and he, like rides his bike with his kids all day like he's fine and then I thought no like financially no. that is no way to live especially when you're if you are the sole provider for your family we were in a unique situation with our agency that we both started with because they required college education to get hired yes which yes. I really do believe that they are the catalyst for me ending up going further with my education. Right. But I remember having conversations with young officers and they would say, oh, should I go get you know my, my bachelor's degree? Yes, go get your bachelor's degree, but don't get it in criminal justice. I know. Get your degree in something that if today or tomorrow you can't do this job, you've got something to fall back on, you know? That's great advice. And I... For you going all the way on towards your psychology degree, and and I want to, I want to hit on something that is interesting. Um, and if I remember correctly, you got to do or defend your dissertation in Belgium. Uh, I presented it in Australia. Australia. Yes. I knew it was somewhere foreign. Yes. So going down that road that you went, challenging as it is, and and I commend you for having, because. For many in the law enforcement field, I think it would be easy to have the dream, but then you get too used to the steady income. Your life kind of develops a routine. It's like, I can't leave and and go do this. Yeah, because you have so much time in. And yeah, yeah. But the, the positive side is when you go to the length that you went, you get to go to another country to defend your dissertation. What was that like? Yeah, that that was a really neat opportunity because my dissertation chair, who was, you know, one of our regular professors, and we did it early on. So it was maybe our third year of my five-year program. You know, you're not expected to have your dissertation done until the very end. Some people don't graduate for a long time because they're still working on it, trying to defend it. But he approached a couple of us and said, hey, I already have this database I just need students to start pulling numbers and doing work on it. If you guys are interested, there's a symposium in Australia that we could all present the research together, but you just got to do it now instead of waiting two years from now. And I was like, sign me up first off because I love to travel. But second, 
I want to get this out of the way as much as possible. Um, and you already have a database for me. I don't have to like send out surveys to people and find research subjects. <laughs> Done. So it, it was a wonderful opportunity that was just sort of handed to me in a way. And interestingly enough, it was on a, it's, it's totally boring what I did. It's just statistical analysis, but it was on. Not to somebody who likes statistics. I know, true. <laughs> They're like, tell me more. Um, but it was on a, an assessment tool for law enforcement that was predictive in nature that actually you give to, to law enforcement and had already been, had been normed on um, officers in New Orleans. And it would tell you of literally like the 19 top reasons that cops get in trouble or lose their jobs, that how likely this person was to get in trouble for domestic violence or hmm. DUI or uh, use of force um, type stuff. And so it's just weird that I ended up doing my dissertation in a police psychology realm. Because you didn't want to be a police I psychologist. Oh, God, no. Why would I ever do that? Um, so it, we all took our piece. We did our different type of research. And we all flew down to Australia. I think my husband and I, like, just paid off that credit card. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were like, we, you know, when, when you're both cops and you got, like, cop money and you got no kids and... We're like, we're going business class to Australia. It was awesome. It was epic. We And I hate the word epic, but we, we definitely did it right. But it was life-changing in the sense that I was like, I really like this academic world. I like it a lot. And we were totally nervous. We're, here we are, still students, presenting our material. And I think like only a handful of people showed up to the symposium, which I was totally fine with because I didn't need people there anyway. And then our professor took us out like, on a wine tour of the Barossa Valley afterwards. It was just, I was like, I could get used to this. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Um, and I made it my goal after that to either present or publish something every single year. Like that was just my goal. And I have, except for the year that I had my daughter consistently, I've done that. And I've tried to take advantage internationally as much as possible. And that's how I kind of weave travel into my life is that I'll have a conference abroad and then we will tack on a few other days and always pick like a secondary city to go see as well. But to this day, when I publish something, I still send it to my dissertation chair. I'm like, hey, look what I did, you know? <laughs> and he's like, ah, so proud of you. That's awesome. But having people like that is really, really important. And, and same thing with my law enforcement mentor. I will, every time I kind of hit a new milestone, like I send him a little message and say, look what I'm doing. <laughs> and, and I love supervising students. I don't get to do that in this job. I, I really miss that. But supervising students was really, really rewarding, um, much in the same way I'm sure being an FTO is, um, but really to be able to give back. It's just, it's such a cool thing to be in this position now where I've supervised students, but then I'm also still <laughs> letting the people who came before me, you know, know what I'm doing. And then I'm still trying to make those people proud. Being involved in the teaching process really affirms how much you really have a grasp of what you know. Yes. And, and I'm not trying to make it sound like, oh, I'm so, I'm the greatest. It just, when, when you're imparting knowledge to somebody who's just starting and like you talked about, you didn't hit the overheads on a traffic stop where when you're three, four years into it, that is so rote memory. You, you don't even don't realize even you, know. yeah. that you you clicked on the overheads. And so when you're involved in that teaching process and you see that person who their eyes get big and, and you're like, that's, that's basic. But it just reaffirms yeah. how much, because there's times where every one of us in our daily life, you're like, man, I don't think I know everything. And or, or you, you don't think that you've gained as much knowledge as you really have. And then you have those moments where you pass something on to somebody and it's like, oh, yeah. maybe I do kind of have a grasp of what I'm doing. Yeah, in some sense. But you're right. The the more you learn, the less you know, right? And that that's that's where this podcast is so rewarding for me is because, and when I say this podcast, I don't mean yours. I mean mine. <laughs> No, yours, I'm sure yours the, will be really this rewarding. This is the one that's rewarding. Come on. 
but I get to have an excuse to dive into these areas that are so interesting to me. And, you know, we're forensic psychologists, but like, we don't know everything. So there can be a topic that comes up that we just dive into the research and we're like, holy shit, this is way more crazy than we even thought, more interesting. And we learn something new and it it's as much of a a fun process for Scott and I to to kind of have this this project to do together as best friends, but also to learn and then we're kind of passing it on to people. Yeah. And and we have a ton of psychology students that listen and um, are constantly like emailing us and we've met with some of them. They're like, oh, I have to do this project for class. Will you meet with me to answer questions? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'll jump on a Zoom with you. Let's do it. And so um I don't know. This is this is such a sweet spot to be in. Like I feel like truly so much of my experience has come full circle to where I'm doing a job that I really love. I'm doing side projects that I really love and family is able to be balanced. Like it it's just a really nice spot to be in at this point in life. That is the most important thing. I think you hit the nail on the head is whatever you whatever encompasses your life it's got to be something that can be balanced with all aspects of your life. Yeah. Balancing your family, balancing your job, balancing your social life, your personal life. Um, and I, I think that that is probably the biggest struggle. I don't want to characterize law enforcement, but I believe we do struggle with that. Yeah. We tend to be insular in that we, we just want to hang out with our kind. Right. Um, we, we tend to leave work at work which means when we come home, again, like we talked about earlier, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. But you, you tend to not expose your family to it. So you, you tend to put yourself in an island. Mm -hmm. And if you're not with your like kind, you're a fish out of water. Yeah. And so that's the, the biggest struggle, I think, that people need yeah. to really work on and, and constantly every day sit there and go, what am I doing to make myself the best me? Right. And I I like the term work-life blend better than balance because it's never going to truly be balanced. You True. know, we're kind of setting ourselves up for this unrealistic expectation of having all of our shit together and everything being balanced. One is going to ask more of you at any given time and you're going to have to like pivot and hopefully agencies and the people you work for can be understanding of that to a certain degree rather than just seeing you as a number. And if you're going through something at home, it needs to go both ways. You need to be able to feel safe enough to talk to people to say like, I might be off my game a little bit today because I got, you know, this going on without, you know, saying too much, but then also having the support where they're not just like, well, sorry, suck it up. Right. You know, in the moment, of course, like if there's something real hairy situation, officer safety wise, like, yeah, <laughs> you need to not be thinking about that thing, but it, it to find what your blend is, and everyone's blend is going to be different because you can have, you know, the young new guy that doesn't have his own family that can work all the overtime in the world that, and that's fine, you know, that's his priority. And if you're the person who wants to be home every Sunday and you have your family barbecues and that's your top priority, that's great too. And we shouldn't be judging each other for it. Gotcha. And it shouldn't create animosity against each other, whether it's, you know, horizontally with peers or vertically with supervisor, supervisors and supervisees. Agreed. Just kind of seeing people as people. So kind of working towards a wrap up on this. Somebody today is sitting in a law enforcement career, but they're thinking to themselves, I want to go be a psychologist. Mm -hmm. Can they get all the way to that point of, stopping their law enforcement career and starting their psychology career without having to take a leave of absence. Is it possible? I have seen it happen. Yeah, it's possible. It's going to depend, going to depend on your assignment that you're in. And of course, at agencies, you know, you have to <laughs> have some level of seniority where you're at to be comfortable and be able to stay in a spot. Um, where I've seen it work is usually someone that is about retirement age anyway. Okay. They're kind of looking towards retirement. So they're not really um, having to give up like the benefits of a pension and things like that. 
but they're also in a space where, you know, maybe they're working a detective position. So they, their schedule is very fixed and it's not going to be calling out in the middle of the night and, and things like that necessarily. So that they have their 410 schedule and then they find a program that works for them. And there's so many more options now with hybrids and online programs to be able to do that. Internships can be done at half time. So most schools will work with people and say, okay, it's going to take you two years or a year and a half, but we'll allow you to work less hours for it. It just depends on the preference of the person. But I, I have, in the last couple of years, I've, I've seen a detective uh, smoothly transition into that and went to a very good university for it, um, did his dissertation in police psychology. The department actually granted him access to um, – study what he wanted to study, which is really hard. Most agencies won't agree to that because they right. just don't know, like, okay, where's this information going? <laughs> and what if it isn't flattering? Um, it's possible. You just have to find what works for you. You know, for me, I feel like I I kind of had the, the easier way out because it was early on in my career right. and I had this other plan. Like, it was my plan all along. But I stayed longer than I thought. I, I mean, I ended up doing seven years and – no, I was only planning on doing four, but it was absolutely the best experience ever for all of the tough times. I wouldn't take any of it back for the world now that I'm on this side of it. And I think it makes me a better clinician today to be able to, you know, see the officer sitting in front of me that's kind of dancing around telling me about what they're feeling after the shooting. And I'm, I can kind of provide some psychoeducation, not necessarily, you know, outing myself for like what I've been through, but it sounds like you're feeling this, this, and this, and that feels pretty surreal and weird. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> being, being able to relate without having to go, and I went through it too, or, or just right. being able to say the right, I'll use a, the right buzzword or the right totally. trigger word. Yeah. Yeah. I'm able to, to sort of name it or label it maybe quicker than someone else, but it, it definitely informs my, my job every single day now. Now, to be a psychologist, so for instance, somebody who's interested in becoming a lawyer, uh -huh. if they don't go to the right law school, they can only be a lawyer in a certain state, you know, depending on, yeah. is, is psychology the same way or? So you, is to be licensed as a psychologist, the licensure goes under your state. So in California, you have to uh, get your doctorate and you can either, you can get it in like the traditional is your philosophy doctorate, so a PhD. You can get a doctorate in psychology, which is what I have. It's a PsyD. Uh, there's also an educational doctorate and um, EDD. So those three are the most common doctorates that people go into programs to obtain those. So you go into your program, through your internships, you get a certain amount of hours, and then you graduate after finishing your dissertation, and then you have to do postdoc hours, and then you take licensure exam, and then you can be blessed by the state of California to be to call yourself a psychologist. Somebody cannot call themselves a psychologist if they are not licensed okay. in the state of California. It's different in other states, um, but you can only practice here. Your patients have, now with telehealth, your patients have to also be in the same state that you're in. Oh, wow. So they could be up north, or wherever, but so, if one of my clients says, hey, I'm going to the river for the weekend, can I have a session? And I'm like, nope, because you're so in Arizona. So these new apps that are out or these new platforms where you can speak to somebody on your phone, you and your patient have to be in the same state yes, in theory? Yes, where you're licensed. And you can be licensed in multiple states. A lot of people are. Is there reciprocity or you have to no. take exams in each state that you You have to take exams. Uh, well, so California is not a reciprocity state. So... Uh, some other states are, but in emergencies or crisis situations, there's some workarounds. So actually during COVID, the American Psychological Association lifted that. So you could do therapy across state lines because of the pandemic. It was like, it was the only time that I know of that that's really been lifted like that. Or let's say, you know, there's like a Hurricane Katrina and they need a bunch of therapists to fly out there that is another situation like an emergency where it could be okay. To so you that. get temporary status to yeah. practice. Yeah. 
exactly. for this given period of time. Exactly. So now, uh, as far as moving from state to state, is it simply like, okay, I went through all my education in California, I took my my exams in California, but now I want to move to Tennessee, which is a, a hotbed right now. It sure is. Um, just go take the exam in Tennessee, and then you can. Sometimes um, I've had I've known people that I went to grad school with that have left and gone, you know, maybe back home to back east, and have had some real struggles where they were like, um, we're not sure if your schooling program qualifies. Gotcha. And they're like, what? <laughs> so it's it's different everywhere you go. Just do your research ahead of time. Um, and I would say really do your research on the programs. If you're just starting out, that's the best advice I could give because there are a lot of diploma mills out there that will give you a degree, but is it accredited are internships going to take people from those programs? There's a lot of research you have to do on the front end. And then my last question will be is if, I don't want to phrase this. Um, everybody, every, I think most people, when they think of taking an exam, they think of the bar exam. Mm -hmm. um, granted, being a doctor, there's there's exams, but Put it in perspective, what's the totality of the exam process to become a psychologist? It's fucking awful. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> that narrows it down. If I have PTSD over anything, it's that exam. Um, it's like any of those exams. It is such a poor representation of what you actually know and what your... Uh, capacity is as a potential psychologist or therapist. Okay, I'm going to admit this. It took me four times to pass it. And I will say two of those I was pregnant, so I did not have all of my brain with me, but I was like, I am going to pass this test before this baby comes out. <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> um, it's learning a test taking style, which is bullshit. Okay. Um, and I am a good test taker. I I love that you're not very opinionated. Oh, I love the uh, fact that you're very I'm kind of neutral indecisive. about it. <laughs> <laughs> I have traditionally been a very good test taker. My academics have always been strong. You know, I don't get nervous. I'm like, yeah, let's go when there's a test. This thing was just a beast. And the knowledge that you get, and I think I was, I would admit, I'm I was behind the curve in my mindset because if you remember, I wasn't planning on being a psychologist. So I, every time the professor was like, take this down, it's on the exam. <laughs> I was like, I'm not getting licensed. Who cares? Um, so I did have to get into that mindset a little bit more. And so I think that was, um, that was probably my demise on the first go round because I did very poorly. I was like, I'm great at tests. Um, so you have to, you have to go through these like study programs that teach you how to take the test. And I mean, there's all sorts of ways, but I would just, again, my advice would be invest the money into the study programs up front. Don't take those hand-me-down study guides from your, you know, uh, internship supervisor that took it 10 years ago because I tried to do all that easy, lazy way and it did not work. Um, and the pressure, you put a lot of pressure on yourself. Actually, the last time that I took it, I, it hadn't been, it hadn't been a long time in between. And as my studying was kind of like, eh, and my husband said, and it's like $700 every time you take the test. And my husband was like, take the money. Don't tell anyone you're taking it and just go do it. And I did. And I hadn't told anyone and I passed it. And so I think you put that pressure on yourself with the expectations of people are like, have you taken your test yet? Have you passed yet? Where are you at? And then you're trying to get a job. And <laughs> Well, and I would imagine there's added pressure when you're with your peer group and they're starting to pass the exam. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're a little removed from that, but because it's not like you're all together. This is post-graduation. But still, like, people are like, oh, I'm getting this job. And, you know, you're, we stay more connected now than you ever do. But yeah, definitely. So what that. is the what is the the testing consist of? Is it all like multiple choice the entire thing? Is it combination? Yeah, no, it's it's multiple choice. Uh, you go into you go into these testing centers, and they literally pat you down. They um, you can only bring in like certain items. 
I remember the one time, one of the times when I was pregnant, I was also sick. I had a cold. They wouldn't let me bring my own pack of tissues. I couldn't take cold medication because I was pregnant and I was like that girl you don't want to be sitting next to because I'm sniffling and like <laughs> so distracted the whole time. Can you imagine taking it during COVID? They'd probably send you out of the building. Oh, good God. I know. I know. But it's, it, it's awful. And, and I remember the, the first time I took it, I'm like, all right, here we go. And I'm like squaring up in front of the computer. And the first test, the question comes up and I'm like, is this a fucking joke? Like, what kind of question is this? And this is the first one. I am screwed. So it, yeah, you just go in and it's all computerized. Um, there is some irony in that though. Taking the test to be a psychologist and the first question you're looking at is like, this right? question's dumb. <laughs> what are they trying to get at here? <laughs> I know. Ha ha. It's all back on us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you also, most programs require that you have to go and be a, a client of therapy for about 30 hours. Oh, okay. So I had to go get my own psychologist during the time that I was in school. So you found out you were crazy during the process? Yes. Good. Yes. Well, no, was I was I was like, what am I going to talk about? Like, I know I'm a college student, I'm stressed, and but I don't know. And I found this woman, this wonderful woman who, she had done a little bit of work with first responders, and her husband had been a police officer. And her specialty was in trauma. And I was like, well, maybe I can like learn something from her. And then like two months into therapy, I got in my second shooting and I was like, all right, it's on. <laughs> like, Are you ready for this? <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so can I schedule extra sessions? Um, so it was actually beautiful timing for that. And she had the experience to work with what I was bringing to the table. So, so to wrap this up, what's on the future for your podcast? Oh, man. So we put out, with our jobs, we can only put out two episodes a month. We we put them out on Wednesday, every other Wednesday. And then the Saturday, which is today for me, um, following an episode release, we do a live stream. And it's very casual. It's kind of a follow-up or we'll have guests on to that. And we're just trying to, you know, now that hopefully fingers crossed we can get back out into the world a little bit more we want to do some more live events and this podcast is really taking us in kind of a neat direction where there's been more crossover to like our our professional jobs sort of overlapping into it to where we have been doing presentations and speaking engagements for like law enforcement agencies so we did there was a a task force that the FBI was involved in in San Diego that had us come do, well, actually this was via Zoom, but it was supposed to be in person originally, but we did a presentation on incels and mass violence and risk assessment. Um, and then we had some private companies reach out to us and want something like that as well. So that's been a real, I want to see more of that. You know, it, how can we sort of take what we do in a fun entertainment space, but also every once in a while, we get professional organizations that get wind of it and they're like, hey, will you come <laughs> do that for my work group? And I think they just like one having outsiders sort of come in. I know I always take advantage of that in my jobs. Having diff a, a different perspective, you know, looking at it from the psychological perspective is kind of neat. And of course, we just try to keep it entertaining and uh, relatable to, to the people. So I want to get out and do more things in person and presentation-wise and panels, which we've been um, really grateful to be a part of as we were getting started and um, see if we can bring more professional presentations to law enforcement agencies. Well, I wish you continued success, success with yours. Thanks. thanks. Um, I appreciate you coming here and being on mine today. My pleasure. I love being a guest. I hate interviewing. Those oh, of really? you that have interview-style podcasts, ugh. My best friend does one. My daughter has an, a podcast and she interviews people. <laughs> well, we'll save all that for the next time you come oh on because you've got your whole like social travel media blog. Oh my God. Yeah, I still do that a little bit. So we'll just leave that for the next time. Yeah, but, but interviewing is hard. So it, it really isn't if you have the right people. It, it, if you just, you know, if ask the question and then yeah. let them go. So it helps having a person on the other side of the table True. who understands and is open to 
you know, beyond just a yes, no. Yeah. No, I, I, I commend you for, for starting this. I think it's a really, it's going to fill a really important void for the type of audience that's going to be drawn to it. And I, I think it will have an impact on people getting them to think down the road. I hope so. Or, you know, finally pull the pin on what they've been wanting to do. So it's awesome. Well, cool. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for taking your time to listen to the podcast. I truly hope you enjoyed it. Not only is the podcast available on audio platforms, but you can also watch it on YouTube at the Transition Drill Podcast channel. The best way you can help the show is by getting the word out. Please subscribe for future episodes. If you think somebody else might enjoy it, I would appreciate it if you would share it with them. Also, if you have the time, please go to Apple Podcast and leave me a rating. I welcome your feedback, both positive and negative. You can also go to the website, transitiondrillpodcast.com, and through the contact tab, send a message directly to my email with any comments or suggestions. Thank you again, and I hope you tune in for the next one.